to segue into a little bit about what's the future of facilities hold. And uh, I'm pleased that our first speaker is Felix Poulin. And uh, Felix is Senior Manager of New Broadcast Technologies at CBC. And you heard from this morning our first panel talking about the Joint Task Force on Network Media. So I'll give you Felix again. Felix. I have this uh, challenging task to, to do the first after the lunch. Uh, I will start by the end. I'll talk about the conclusion of my oh, presentation. If you need to take a nap or do some emails after, then you're good. <laughs> so uh, at CBC, we need, uh, we're moving to a new building, and we will need leaner and more dense infrastructures, much smaller building. And, and you, I'll tell you, I'll uh, show you that. Uh, we target for flexible, scalable, and agile, sol agile solution. Uh, for us, IP is really only a stepping stone to get that. The real thing is software-defined resources uh, to achieve our goals. Uh, and I will do a little reality check. Um, 2110 is still young. Uh, very manual and static configuration as of today. Uh, so. Uh, the virtualization and dematerialized facility, it's, uh, it's later on, I would say. So for those who don't uh, know, uh, CBC Radio Canada is the national broadcaster of Canada. Uh, many different services, uh, both language, English, and French, television, radio, uh, digital platforms. We have office throughout the country, um, and we have our two headquarters, uh, Toronto for uh, English services and Montreal for the French. We'll talk about Montreal headquarter because this is where we are going to build a new facility. So on the screen, you see uh, the tower here is the current building. Um, it has uh, it was built in the 70s, uh, 25 floor tower. It's a relatively uh, huge facility. It's 1.2 million square feet. Uh, uh, a third is in the tower, but actually the, the big part of it is, is the ground floor here, and there's two uh, underground uh, where all the studio uh, and warehouse and production facility are. Uh, it's kind of huge. We don't really use that to its full uh, 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 possibility, or, or it was used before. There was much more production on site. Uh, we have uh, 50. Uh, 550 equipment racks uh, and four equipment rooms. Uh, when I say that, it's five, 550, we don't really use that. The density got already improved uh, since uh, it was built. Now the new facility, much smaller, uh, two towers of seven and four floors, about a third of the, the surface, uh, everything above the ground except the parking lot. Uh, much more natural light. Um, the, the data center, the equipment room, we have room for 156 racks and one megawatt of power. And the rest of the equipment will be distributed on the floor nearby the production facilities. Uh, we call it technical closets. So the, the size of the, the project uh, two television production studios and a third one, we call it multi-purpose, can be used as a third production studio, but also multimedia production. <laughs> Ten new studios, six TV control room, uh, 19 radio facilities, uh, 20 editing suite, and the play out, the master control room for TV, radio, and digital play out combined all together for 40 TV channels, 40 digital channels, and 160 radio channels. Everything redundant with our Toronto Center for Disaster Recovery uh, Facilities. Uh, the sizing, uh, we did the exercise of uh, how many uh, endpoints, flows, and traffic we would uh, require. Uh, we talk about the equivalent of SDI matrix of 2,000 by 3,000. Uh, if we look at stereo pairs, 20,000 per 30,000. Um, we plan for UHD, so the UHD ready concept. Probably we start on day one with maybe one or big studio in UHD. 
Uh, but really, we want the infrastructure to support uh, full UHD when we want to do it. And when we do that, we need approximately 21 terabytes of traffic, ter terabytes per second, terabit per second. Um, and if we compare to the file-based traffic, interestingly, file-based is about 10% of that amount. Uh, so it's a small difference. OK. Of course, everything is aligned on strategic objective. You know, you have this cooperative strategic objective. And really, the, the vision here is um, changing work, changing business. We need to be able to adapt quickly and reduce infrastructure um, and real estate. So in order to do that, we look for that flexible, to flexible scalable, agile, uh, agile infrastructure. A uh, technical solution to it is to go 100% IP media interconnect using 2110, using AS67, using PTP, using ISO 4, ISO 5, uh, converge media network to be able to use uh, the file base as well as the real time on the same network. It's very important to achieve uh, the pool and share resources that we want to have and re reusable software defined resources. Spine and leaf infrastructure, the way it's defined, the size of it, the way it's distributed, uh, the redundancy we need uh, call for that kind of, of uh, topology. And 25 and 100 gig, we want to do UHD from day one. Uh, 25 is a nice pipe to do that. And also the economics of a 25, 100 gig network makes sense, uh, start to make sense. So let's go for it. So I was saying, uh, really, the transition to IP is a first step, because ultimately what we want to do is to replace the dedicated hardware and software uh, with software and generic server, virtualized software. Uh, that's the aspiration. Uh, this, this will bring the benefits, but really, we need to start with what's available today with this long-term This concept of pool resources, uh, you know, it's a, it's a vision that has been around for, for some time. I don't need to explain it uh, deeply. Uh, but what we have done, so, uh, yeah, um, the idea of having different studio floor, different control rooms that are interconnected uh, as we need, and a, pool, a set of pool resources that are centralized in our data center. And uh, now what we want to see is when we'll be able to virtualize and therefore share those resources here as much as possible and reuse the, the, the capacity. Um, there's a number of things that can be done today in virtualization. Playout server, there's some offering on the market, file storage, automation systems, everything that is already PC-based, usually database, and all those kind of IT services can be virtualized. Um, we also start to see some traditional hardware equipment like multi-viewer graphics, um, audio devices, mixers, and all intercom. Now there's some beginning of offerings in virtualized environment. So probably another year to get some, some maturity there. And then even long, longer term, it's the, the hardcore uh, video equipment. Uh, video production switcher, although there was a nice demonstration at IBC and NEB, I think it's Karen Ego on the uh, Cisco booth, and they were showing a virtualized uh, vision mixer. So it's not so far, but it's ambitious So uh, for the kind of application we want to, to give. And there's some <coughs> things that will probably never be virtualized where you need power or uh, hardware, uh, you know, FPGA-based. But ultimately, if we could replace everything once we virtualize with generic resources, this is where we'll get the density, uh, the real density benefits, where we can call, uh, configure that plan for a certain type of production. When it's the Olympic, we reconfigure for another type of production. When it's the, the election, we repurpose <coughs> that in another way. And we can uh, scale uh, the technology. OK. Uh, <laughs> That's a dream. <laughs> uh, what's 
very interesting. I, I, I said this morning I changed job from talking about this and imagining this and these possibilities. Now I got a job that is making it work. <laughs> uh, it's a bit less comfortable, but it's very, very much fun. Um, so we start to discuss with the vendor, talking about topology system. We start to have equipment in our lab playing with it. So we found some, some things. I would like to reuse the roadmap. It's there, so why not reusing it? Uh, to show um, where our project fit on that roadmap. So we are today, uh, beginning of ST2110. Uh, we start small by upgrading some regional station and the spirit is a bit like the project that were presented earlier today is uh, those are SDI plant we will use the uh, IP fabric to do the routing and maybe the multi viewer and just to see to explore how it can work it's, it's a prototype for us because now we, we need to imagine what it will be for the big building so we start with some uh, uh, sensible size to start with but very soon, next summer, August 2018, we have the data center available where we need to start to install things. So we need to know what we want there. And according to the roadmap, there should be enough things here, 2110, widely deployed, uh, <coughs> AMOA, uh, IS is uh, implemented and working. So we should be good next summer. Um, we have to be on air in 2020. If we start with the basic, the elementary flows, um, I've been a chance, I have the chance to, to play with a number of devices. Uh, we have very good interoperability demonstration in the big trade show. Now in the lab environment where you start mixing and matching different vendors, there, you know, there's some more work to be done. Um, Interoperability-wise, uh, the PTP also is very, very, uh, uh, there's very various implementations, various understanding of how it works. Um, some end device, for instance, will just listen to the PTP message. They won't do the, 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 the time correction. Uh, we need to think about the topologies of this. It's, there's a lot of learning to be done there. The SDP file, which is mandatory in 2110, is rarely used actually by the senders, or if it's used, sometimes the receiver don't have a standard way to pull it and really use that information. Um, and another um, aspect that I highlighted in red, and there's been some discussion uh, in the, the standards uh, committees and, and, and organization at the moment, the idea of using timestamps to sync, to resync different flows, that is a feature of 2110. Uh, there are some cases that are not yet uh, clarified in the standards in 2110-10. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the consensus to go on and publish those documents without those things, so I'm not blaming anyone <coughs> but myself. Uh, we needed to move on with those standards, but I think very, very quickly we need to put on paper by recognized organization like SEMT, RPZG, AMOA, whoever wants to bring some clarification to those use cases because what I see now is different vendors have different ways to address those different use cases and this will lead to lip sync problems that we didn't want to have using that approach. The auto-provisioning layer, uh, today what I see is a lot of static and manual configuration, a lot of typing of addresses, a lot of going into uh, common line and, uh, and, and making uh, uh, configuration. So it, it's not scalable for us for our big building. Uh, we can live with that for a small station <coughs> with uh, less than 100 endpoints, but for the real thing, uh, we need to automate that. So that's the goal of that layer. ISO 4, it's there. Some people are using it. Some people uh, are you know, having some hard time with interoperability on this level. We feel it's getting there, just question of time. ISO 5, uh, we, we want to use that, 
there are still some issues, uh, some, some features that are very important that needs to be implemented. And I know AMOA has put a lot of priority on this thing, but the whole question of bundling multiple flows and um, uh, needs to be addressed for the real case. Everything that, that was uh, audio breakaways or everything that you could imagine, every typical router scenarios are not necessarily covered at the moment. And this kind of forced the industry to come up with their own uh, APIs and their own solution for that. And there's a risk here that we end up with too many diverse solutions. So I think we, we should put a particular effort on that layer. And ISO 6, uh, Shuba is there, and Thomas, and we're looking forward. I think it's further down the road to really appreciate what it can do in terms of bringing the industry together. So I, I really think, and I said that this morning, that we need to make the same exercise of harmonization that happened with 2110 a year ago with AIMS bringing together the, all the vendors to come up to a kind of an industry consensus on this layer as well. Because there's really a risk here we end up with many different proprietary uh, technologies and that's not good for us. And here it is, the dematerialized facility. That's a dream, that's where we're heading. Uh, <clears throat> most of our energy at the moment is to make the bottom layer work. So uh, we need to deliver a building. Um, as much as possible, whenever it's possible, we will use non-specific IT uh, equipment. Uh, when there's a system that is available on a commoditized uh, server or uh, using uh, common network with not too many media-specific features, we'll choose that one. Um, the cloud fit, uh, we see that for some corner case applications, some uh, remote production, remote, uh, for example, uh, remote editing. Uh, for live production, it's, it's still a, a bit further down the road. Uh, and I believe that's the right time, probably, to, uh, to, to get a step back, go back to JTNM reference architecture. I think we have implemented a part of it. There's still many things to be done that area, and I think that's probably a good time to revisit that. Our wishes for standardization, and uh, the leadership of SEMT is, is in the room, so I think it's, it's mostly uh, for you um, and the other organization, but uh, we want, to, we want to, um, to stress that <coughs> development of standards and specifications should be driven by user requirement as much as possible. And one way maybe to help the user to, to encourage them to contribute in this discussion, because I know that's what the industry want to hear, uh, is maybe to give a better access to the user to contribute. Why not making it free for user to contribute user requirements or create a special uh, type of, of, of participants. Um, we would like also to see specification and standard uh, being publicly available. For example, on GitHub, the example of uh, Anwa uh, IS is a good example where uh, GitHub is very transparent, everybody has access, and also you can see the difference from version to version. So tools like that, I think, help accelerate the adoption of, of standard and specification. And uh, we mentioned it uh, today, uh, free standards. IETF standards are free and the internet community and the, uh, this, the young guy with the, uh, with the bottle of Red Bull, that's, that's what they want to use. They, they won't pay anyway for, they will find the standard somewhere anyway. Uh, when we want to do open source development, imagine that you have one standard that is, for example, 2110, which is a suite of standards which has a lot of dependency with a lot of other standards. It means that each of those young Red Bull guys need to buy uh, a big set of 10, 20 standards. They won't do that. So I, I think we need to think about this because uh, as we move towards software, we, we will want to, uh, to, to benefit from that, that kind of community. Um, an example of this is uh, CBC have uh, invested over the last year into uh, uh, 
developing some tools in FFmpeg to be able to uh, use 2110. The SDP parsing, the demoxing, the decoding of the audio and video essences are FC uh, 4175. Um, it's now included in the main branch of FFmpeg. It's not completed, we need to work on the synchronization, we need to do some optimization, the dash 40 is not yet implemented. We just worked so far and tested 1080p, we'll want to do some more formats and more and more and more things. We want to publish an auto just to know how to use that. So uh, the goal to do that is not to replace the industry. We'll still continue to buy kit from vendors with their expertise, with the nice doing, with the support. But by putting uh, those technology in these kind of uh, widespread um, software that, that are reused a lot, uh, we believe we can help accelerate the adoption of the standards. So we're looking for partners. We want not to do that alone. So if you're interested to join this, uh, we can do more. We can share the cost. Uh, it's relatively cheap compared to uh, what kind of expense we have in our industry. And, and we have some good tools. So this is what it will look like, the building, I will enter the building, oh, no, we won't enter the building. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of natural light, uh, public spaces, uh, very different from today. So that's what's today. <laughs> we'll have access to the data center in 43 weeks and two days from today. So will the technology be ready? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that vision of the future with us, Felix. And now rejoining us is Thomas Edwards to uh, share his thoughts about where we're going in the future. So I'll say this talk is not just about where we're going, but about all the problems we're going to have. This is, this is, a, complete, this is a complete problem uh, presentation. Virtualization challenges. Let's try to remember what is the problem we're trying to solve. And you'll hear these words thrown around a great deal. Peter, Peter Dare, he's out in Australia somewhere. I know, he's not, yes, he's not here, he's in Australia. Um, flexible, comes, comes from Latin flectere, meaning, meaning to bend, to be able to be easily modified, to respond to altered or circumstances and conditions. Are there altered or uh, circumstances or conditions in our industry right now? Do we have any tremendously disruptive things happening to our business? Yes, we have to be flexible. Agile comes from Latin agere, meaning do. So not only do we have to be flexible uh, to change, we have to be able to do it. And we have to be able to do it well and do it quickly. So that's flexible and agile. So when we talk about virtualization, there are a lot of sub-elements that people think about. So it's all basically software-based solutions, one way or another. Uh, there's the virtualized software solutions. So that's not just software, but software that's abstracted out from any particular hardware solution. And then there's whether you're going to do it in a private cloud on premises, or whether in the instances includes both file processes, like transcoding, as well as live processes, like live graphics or video switching. And then there's the public cloud world, where of course on public cloud we also file processes. Every, you know, everything that's done uh, on Netflix is done as file processes in the public cloud. Uh, all of their processing <coughs> is done there. And live processes are just beginning to crank up on the cloud. We're seeing some examples of uh, you know, kind of your standard channel playout solutions that run on AWS. Today, we're just really going to address this, the private cloud on-prem live processes. And why? Because this, well, this is almost the hardest. Technically, I think this is really the hardest, but this is the, this is the next thing that I think we're going to have to hit to bring it inside our plan. So this is an example of a virtualized uh, system 
we've got multiple virtual machines. We have VM1 and VM2. Uh, they've got their own virtual CPUs, and those virtual CPUs are being scheduled by the hypervisor onto physical CPUs. So the challenge with any of these virtualized solutions is there's a lot of opportunity uh, for things to go wrong, to have contentions between all these very different elements for the limited amount of actual physical resources. So different tasks are going to be competing for the virtual CPU. Uh, we're going to have virtual CPUs competing for the physical CPUs. We have virtual uh, VM memory, which is going to be uh, contending with physical, uh, with, for physical memory. Uh, we've got sharing the last level cache, or L3 cache, on the actual uh, chip itself. And we've got sharing network interface cards. So if you have 10 different processes and they all want to use the same network interface card, there's potential for contention there as well. And all these contentions can produce unexpected latency. And what's the worst thing in live broadcast? Unexpected latency, right? So these are the, the things that we're going to have to solve. So this is an example of packet pacing. Uh, so imagine we have a bunch of software senders. In this case, we've got three software senders. They are sending uh, into three different ports, which are input ports on an Ethernet switch. They all converge, and they all come out of the, outputs, uh, the output of the switch. Now, I imagine if this is a 10 gigabit switch, I'm sending in three times one gigabit streams. You're like, well, OK, there are three times one gigabit streams. So we'll have one three gigabit stream coming out of the switch you'll never have any problems. That, that's, it turns out it's not quite true. And this is an issue about what's a long-term average versus a short-term average. So imagine these three senders, they all generate three packets at exactly the same time. So the three packets come in. Obviously, it's a 10 gigabit switch. It can't, you have three 10 gigabit bursts coming in. It can't send them all out at the same time. So there's on-chip SRAM on the uh, silicon inside these switches. Uh, it gives you about 66 packets worth of buffer uh, uh, per 10 gigabit port. And this is, this is an average. The, the switches are over a range, but this is kind of something standard, like a Broadcom Trident you might see. So they, they buffer up. And of course, you know, first the, the, red, the red packet goes out, and then the yellow packet goes out, and then the blue packet goes out. And then you know, that's fine. And they all come in again. They buffer up because it happened. You know, worst case scenario happened to all come in at the same exact time. They buffer up. They drain out, they drain out, uh, they drain out. And again, one more time. So because the pacing here was good, this all worked fine and everything was great. Yes, did we use the buffer a little bit? Yes. Was it a problem? No, it wasn't a problem. Now here's the, the not so good software center. So it first comes in, okay, same thing happens. And then oh, it kind of misses something. There was some type of contention. Maybe a virtual CPU was trying to get to a physical CPU and it couldn't get fast enough or what have you. And then, oh, it misses it again. Oh, what's happening here? So now it knows I'm two packets behind. I've really got to catch up. So how am I really going to catch up? I'm going to send, I'm going to send them out. I'm going to send them out. Of course, they're going to, they're going to buffer. Send it out. It'll buffer. Send it out, try to catch up, and oh, I've just blown up my buffers. Because, because while the short term, sorry, while the long term average of those uh, streams coming in was a gigabit per second, the short term was more like line rate. So that's the problem that we face. Why is this a big issue for virtualization? Well, here is a FPGA-based SMPTE 2022-6 source. And this is done on a, a Tektronix Prism, which is actually a pretty cool little device. Uh, this is looking at Nevion VS902. It's great, FP, great little FPGA device. Uh, if you look at the packet inner arrival time, so this is a graph. Uh, you know, we have the packet inner arrival time plotted up versed on microseconds. And you get a histogram here. Uh, so you see almost every single packet is coming in with a packet in arrival time of about 7.4 microseconds, which is what you'd expect for SMPTE 2022-6, a packet every 7.4 microseconds, except for the last packet in the frame, which comes a little bit faster. Uh, if we look over a longer period of time, here we're looking over a five second period, the, the max is 7.5 microseconds, the mean is 7.4, the minimum is 2.7 microseconds. Looks, looks really good. Now imagine we have a software uh, source. So this is a NTOP Disk 2N. 
uh, just running on bare metal on a, a standard server. Uh, we'll take a look at the histogram here. So you see almost most of the time we've got, you know, kind of a couple of, you know, in the 10 microsecond department. But every now and then we have these outliers. Why is this outlier here? I can't tell you. I don't know what's going on. Uh, it could be, could be memory contention. It uh, could be NIC contention. We just don't know. Uh, but again, everything's within a millisecond. So it's not, it's not horrific. Uh, we take a look over about a minute. Yeah, maximum is about a millisecond. Yeah, it means about 1.2 microseconds. No back-to-back -back packets, which is nice. But, but again, the, the, we did have one point where it stopped talking for a millisecond. Not great. Now, this is a VMware virtualized 2022-6 source who shall remain anonymous. And I will admit this was the first prototype that I got from a vendor. Uh, if we take a look at packet and arrival times, you see kind of really spread out over hundreds of microseconds. And some of them are out here at 2.6 milliseconds. And if you look over a long period of time, so I'm looking, I'm going to wait for 24 minutes and look at the worst case scenario. It stopped talking for 12.6 milliseconds. That's almost two thirds of a 60p frame. Just, just sat there and who knows what was going on, right? With all the different virtual machines uh, running on the software solution, you know, we don't know. Uh, and this is obviously a problem. So we've got we've to work on this. So another question is, how much buffer can these switches really provide in these situations? Uh, and there's a internet RFC 2544 that has this great test called a back-to-back -back test. And what happens is that you get a burst of packets, one through n, uh, every certain period of time. So you can keep a long-term bandwidth on one of these flows. Let's say we'll set it to a gigabit per second. But then during this period of time when you've got the bursting packets coming out, they're coming out at line rate, one right after another. There's, there's basically no time in between them. Uh, we were using you know, 15, 18 uh, octet long frames, uh, try, to, try to maximize that. Uh, and they all converge onto the switch. They all come out the output. And then you do the packet analysis <coughs> on the output of the switch. And what you do is you start with some n, and you increase it, and you increase it. So these bursts are getting longer and longer and longer until you start seeing packet loss. So this is a result of one of these tests. So we started with 100 is our burst size, and we went up by 10. So we went 100, 110, 20, 130, 140, 150. Then at 160, we started losing frames. So um, this, this is uh, the way you, you perform this test. You'll notice the max latency, of course, goes up because those packets are being held in the buffer for a very long time. So it's not just a packet loss problem. It's also a potential latency problem. But the loss is obviously the, that's completely unacceptable. So these are some of the results we got. And unfortunately, uh, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Spirant for being nice enough to bring their $100,000 device by my lab for a while, <laughs> messing around with this. Now, we only had eight ports on the test device, the Spirant C50. Uh, we did one test with just four. And then we said, now we'll, we'll, try, we'll try using all eight, where there's seven, seven input ports and one output port on the Spirant being used. And we measured the largest burst without loss. And you can kind of assume that based on that, you can do some calculations and imagine what the Q size is that would handle that burst occurring. And then you can compare it with the claims on the spec sheet of the switch. Right? So the spec sheet says, ah, 6.7 megabytes of, of, bu of buffer. But no, you really are only able to use one. Now, some of that might be due to the fact we're only using a subset of ports. In this case, there are only seven input ports. So maybe if you used all you know, 48 ports or whatever, maybe it would be different. Maybe it's because we're doing multicast, and some of that buffer is going to be dedicated to unicast. And the truth is you know, there's a limitations based on the silicon you're using, and there's also limitations based on the design of the vendor who's taking that silicon and implementing a Ethernet switch, they can make some decisions about how to carve that, that buffer up. So uh, we try to relate this to SMPTE 2110 21, which are the network compatibility. Uh, well, I, I should say 2110 21 has a bunch of different uh, rules, but one of them is the network compatibility sender rules. And you imagine a SMPTE 2110 20 sender is sending packets into this uh, virtual buffer, um, C full. 
And what happens is the C-fold drains out with a rate. And the rate is pretty simple. It's the length of the frame divided by the number of packets in a frame with a, a little kicker here so it drains out a little bit faster than, than you'd expect the video to come in. And there are limits. Uh, they're called C-max. Uh, so that's how many packets you can have in this buffer before, before you're breaking the rules. Uh, C-max is 16 for HD streams for wide senders. And we are imagining the wide senders will be software senders. And then four for the narrow senders, which we imagine are probably going to be FPGA-based senders. So we can take our back-to-back -back burst tests, and we can imagine, well, what's the worst case scenario in SMPTE 2110-21? It's back-to-back it's -back bursts. It's uh, loading up that buffer as fast as you can. Uh, so we can uh, take the results that we picked up from RFC 2544 and kind of back it into the SMPTE 2110-21 rules. So we can say, in a worst case scenario, again, when these senders are perfectly synchronized, they're all sending back-to-back -back bursts into the switch at the same time, how many narrow senders can I have? And you know, for some, uh, for some of these, you know, the numbers are 200, 100, or this one's nice, five, nearly 500. And then how many wide senders can we have? And of course, the answer is a lot less, you know, basically a factor of four or less, because you know, it's 16 versus four, right? So you've got you know, 60, 50. This switch only takes 26 wide senders, 122. And you might naively think, well, I've got a 48 port, 10 gig switch. I should be able to handle 300 senders, right? Uh, yes, if they were perfectly paced senders, you could handle 300. If they're N senders, it would be a little bit less. And if it's W senders, it might be a lot less. So we're hoping to continue to do this testing with additional switches beyond just the ones I happen to have in my lab the day the Spirit guys came by uh, to try to get a better feeling uh, you know, across a wider range of switches, exactly what their capabilities are for these different SMPTE 2110-21 network compatibility rules. So. Uh, Something else we're doing uh, within the Fox Lab is what I call the Live Virtualized Terrarium Project. And our concept, if you excuse the title, the concept here is to you know, allow us to become familiar with software-based virtualized broadcast ecosystems. So it's going to be uncompressed, low latency live. It's all IP. There's no SDI. Uh, this will try to help us to identify the hardware requirements for these virtualized software solutions and to try to learn about the specific ones, uh, do long-term testing. So not, don't just look at them for a few minutes, but look at them actually over a period of weeks to do testing and validation of these software-based solutions. And I'll try to do some ad hoc interoperability testing uh, between uh, different, different products and different vendors. So you know, in conclusion, I'm going to say that virtualization is going to be a key tool for flexibility and agility of the broadcast plan. And it, it, but it does have significant challenges for isochronous flows due to all those contentions that we discussed. And converging network flows have a particular risk of packet buffering or packet loss with badly paced packets. So we're going to be doing some more real world testing of software senders and switch fabrics in order to understand what those safe limits are. And for all the vendors, you know, your job now is going to be in your software to do uh, perfect your proper pacing of packets. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Quick question. A couple quick questions. Well, thank you both for sharing uh, your, your thoughts about the future and how we get there and some of the problems that that we're going to encounter, and Thomas, thank you in particular for the, the really clear explanation of some of the issues we're going to face. Um, let, let me ask a, a, a question. From a broadcaster and user perspective, given these kinds of problems, when, when we specify or purchase a, a, you know, a, a VM, uh, you know, cloud-based kind of product, how are we even going to specify its performance, or, or what kind of SLAs are we going to put around these cloud-based you know, elements of a workflow. How, how do we even do that? Well, I think SMPTE 2110-21 is the, 
is going to be your starter, right? Because it, starter. That's, that's what sets the rules of the road. Now, you might want to say you have to follow SMPTE 2110-21 uh, for you know, 48 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours. That, that might be one of the issues. Is how long do you monitor that, right? Because it's not enough just to monitor it for a few seconds and say, oh, everything's fine. Yeah, in, in the short term, um, what we have tried so far with 2110 virtualization will require some hardware uh, support. So it's not pure virtualization. Uh, but that's a good starting point. There's some benefit to do that. Uh, the fact that you can, you can reuse the, the platform for something else is a good benefit. Uh, now, there's some nice things that we are not able to do in virtualization, in pure virtualization which is things like vMotion and VMware World, where you can uh, lively switch images from, from host to host, these kind of nice things. Uh, will it be possible one day to do that with 2110? Uh, I mean, we hope there will be some improvement, or maybe we need something else when we get there. Uh, in terms of, of SLAs, uh, I think it, going, especially going to a third-party provider I think we're, we're far from uh, an SLA model at the moment. It's, it's very challenging. So big challenges. Uh, you know, we're, we're already talking about um, the idea of maybe splitting up UHD flows as, you know, quad splits as we, as we map on to IP interfaces. And I can imagine other kind of splits depending on the, you know, signal processing tasks. How, how do you think that um, what I'm going to call partitioned you know, multiple 2110 essence streams, you know, constituting a whole. H how's that going to impact um, this, this whole virtualization model and the issues we've just been discussing? I'm of two minds of that. Uh, I really dislike the idea of trying to split, uh, you know, 4K into four IP channels. That really disturbs me. I recognize that it might be challenging to bring, you know, in the neighborhood of 10 gigabits per second into an uncompressed software solution. So I think it need, you know, I, I've not seen anything that actually does that yet. So that's, the, the question is, can it, can it be done with today's COTS technology? And I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, 2110 was, was, was designed with, in mind, I have a native uh, raster or, uh, you know, the full UHD in one, in one flow. Uh, so I, I think there's no point to cut it down uh, unless you want to do some uh, optimization carrying on multiple flows and, and there's all kind of, of challenges of synchronization. Uh, but w one thing that you might consider, because there's some room for optimization, when we did our sizing exercise, we realized that a lot of our signal are, are going to feed multi-viewers and that all of those multi-viewers will scale down the image. It will never use the native UHD <coughs> to display. Uh, so there might be some, some tricks there. Uh, should we have a proxy, an HD proxy of the UHD that could go together and the standard would allow to bundle those two uh, uh, signal together? So I think there's, there's opportunities uh, also. Right, well, and this gets yeah. to the compressed versus uncompressed would, representation, right? My, my next question. Pardon. We certainly have codecs that can dramatically reduce the bit rate, uh, you know, at least in half, if not in a third, and there are significantly subframe latency in terms of their processing, right? You, you know, the you know, Tico VC2, the upcoming JPEG XS, even ultra low latency JPEG 2000, although I'm not sure if that plays well in software, but we've, we've got solutions. And the question is, you know, do we, really, do we really need uncompressed video, especially for all of our workflows? Um, now, the nice thing about uncompressed video is no one can argue with it. No one can say, hey, you're screwing with my video quality. Uh, no one can say there's a latency problem. And there's no intellectual property issues to worry about, which is you know, something that concerns me whenever we talk about compression. So, so when it comes to UHD, HDR, which Felix, you said is uh, you know, that, that's something certainly in your roadmap, and we heard that from Andreas as well. When it comes to UHD HDR um, and 12 bits, we get over 10 gigabit kind of link capacity. So are, as users, are you telling me you prefer, would you prefer lightweight compression or would you prefer a, a split? I think I'm here and we prefer the compression. I, I, I'd prefer what works. <laughs> <laughs> now now there's, there's the answer of the day. 
pragmatic, <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, frankly, if, again, if, if, if a compression does what we need it to do yes. and it works on 4K, then why not use it? But, but that's, you know, the, the, I think the problem has been we've had an audio video sync phobia in the industry, which was a good phobia to have, right? We've always been concerned about, well, you know, we've got the, we got the audio, we've got the video, they're going to go through different processing phases and they, they get messed up. So that's why we have to have the, the video processing has to be as low latency as possible so that the audio doesn't get ahead of it, right? And that's less of a problem when you timestamp everything. When you timestamp everything, especially if you can buffer, you buffer up the audio a bit, you can make sure that you always have perfect audio video sync. And then, you know what, that latency doesn't seem so bad anymore. If it's not screwing up your audio video sync, you can take you know, half a frame, a frame of latency. So between splitting, between splitting and, uh, and compression, I would choose 25 gig. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, I think there's no there's no reason not going directly to 25 gig. Yeah, I mean the network the network gear is red. It's it's the software I'm more concerned about. Hmm. Right. We are out of time, so unfortunately I'm going to have to leave further questions to the hallway discussion. But please join me in thanking Thomas and Felix for coming over.